The following is a conversation with Michael I. Jordan, a professor at Berkeley and one of the most influential people in the history of machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. He has been cited over 170,000 times and he has mentored many of the world-class researchers defining the field of AI today, including Andrew Eng, Zubin Garamani, Ben Taskar, and Yoshio Bengio. All this, to me, is as impressive as the over 32,000 points in the six NBA championships of the Michael J. Jordan of basketball fame. There's a non-zero probability that I talk to the other Michael Jordan, given my connection to and love of the Chicago Bulls of the 90s, but if I had to pick one, I'm going with the Michael Jordan of statistics and computer science, or as Jan LeCun calls him, the Miles Davis of machine learning. In his blog post titled, Artificial Intelligence, The Revolution Hasn't Happened Yet, Michael argues for broadening the scope of the artificial intelligence field. In many ways, the underlying spirit of this podcast is the same, to see artificial intelligence as a deeply human endeavor, to not only engineer algorithms and robots, but to understand and empower human beings at all levels of abstraction, from the individual to our civilization as a whole. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. As usual, I'll do one or two minutes of ads now and never any ads in the middle that can break the flow of the conversation. I hope that works for you and doesn't hurt the listening experience. This show is presented by Cash App, the number one finance app in the App Store. When you get it, use code LEXPODCAST. Cash App lets you send money to friends, buy Bitcoin, and invest in the stock market with as little as $1. Since Cash App does fractional share trading, let me mention that the order execution algorithm that works behind the scenes to create the abstraction of the fractional orders is to me an algorithmic marvel. So big props for the Cash App engineers for solving a hard problem that in the end, provides an easy interface that takes a step up to the next layer of abstraction over the stock market, making trading more accessible for new investors and diversification much easier. So once again, if you get Cash App from the App Store or Google Play and use the code LEXPODCAST, you'll get $10, and Cash App will also donate $10 to FIRST, one of my favorite organizations that is helping to advance robotics and STEM education for young people around the world. And now, here's my conversation with Michael I. Jordan. Given that you're one of the greats in the field of AI, machine learning, computer science, and so on, you're trivially called the Michael Jordan of machine learning. Although, as you know, you were born first, so technically MJ is the Michael I. Jordan of basketball. But anyway, my my favorite is Jan LeCun calling you the Miles Davis of machine learning because as he says, you reinvent yourself periodically and sometimes leave fans scratching their heads after you change direction. So can you put at first your historian hat on and give a history of computer science and AI as you saw it, as you experienced it, including the four generations of AI successes that I've seen you talk about? Sure. Yeah, first of all, I much prefer Jan's uh, metaphor. Um, Miles Davis is uh, was a real explorer in jazz, and um, he had a coherent story. So I think I have one, and but it's not just the one you lived; it's the one you think about later. What a good historian does is they look back and they revisit. Um, I think what's happening right now is not AI. That was an intellectual aspiration um, that's still alive today as an aspiration. But I think this is akin to the development of chemical engineering from chemistry or electrical engineering from from electromagnetism. So if you go back to the 30s or 40s, there wasn't yet chemical engineering. There was chemistry, there was fluid flow, there was mechanics and so on. Um, But people pretty clearly viewed uh, interesting goals to try to build factories that uh, make chemicals, products, and do it viably, safely, make good ones, do it at scale. Uh, so people started to try to do that, of course, and some factories worked, some didn't. You know, some were not viable, some exploded. But in parallel, uh, developed a whole field called chemical engineering, 
right? And chemical engineering is a field. It's it's no no bones about it. It has theoretical aspects to it. It has uh, practical aspects. It's not just engineering, quote unquote. It's the real thing. The real concepts are needed. You know, same thing with electrical engineering. You know, there was Maxwell's equations, which in some sense were everything you know about electromagnetism. But you needed to figure out how to build circuits, how to build modules, how to put them together, how to bring electricity from one point to another safely, and so on and so forth. So a whole field developed called electrical engineering. All right, I think that's what's happening right now, is that but, we have we have a proto field, which is statistics, computer, more of the theoretical side of the algorithmic side of computer science. That was enough to start to build things. But what things? Systems that bring value to human beings and use human data and mix in human decisions. The engineering side of that is all ad hoc. That's what's emerging. In fact, if you want to call machine learning a field, I think that's what it is. That's a proto form of engineering based on statistical and computational ideas of previous generations. But it, do you think there's something deeper about AI in his dreams and aspirations as compared to chemical engineering and no. electrical engineering? Well, the dreams and aspirations maybe, but those are from those are 500 years from now. I think that that's like the Greeks sitting there and saying it would be neat to get to the moon someday. Right. Um, I think we have no clue how the brain does computation. Uh, we're just a clueless. We're like we're even worse than the Greeks uh, on most anything interesting uh, scientifically of, of our era. Can you linger on that just for a moment? Because you stand not completely unique, but a little bit unique in that in the clarity of that. Can you can you elaborate your intuition of why we like where we stand in our understanding of the human brain? And a lot of people say, you know, scientists say we're not very far in understanding the human brain. Yeah. But you're like you're saying we're in the dark here. Well, I know I'm not unique. I don't even think in the clarity, but if you talk to real neuroscientists that really study real synapses or real neurons, they agree. They agree. It's, it's a hundred year, hundreds of year task and they're building it up slowly and surely. What the signal is there is not clear. We think we have all of our metaphors. We think it's electrical, maybe it's chemical. It's, it's a whole soup. It's ions and proteins and it's a cell. And that's even around like a single synapse. If you look at a Electron micrograph of a single synapse. It's a it's a city of its own, and that's one little thing on a dendritic tree, which is extremely complicated, you know, electrochemical thing, and it's doing these spikes and voltages are being flying around, and then proteins are taking that and taking it down into the DNA, and who knows what. Um, so it is the problem of the next few centuries. It is fantastic, but we have our metaphors about it. Is it an economic device? Is it like the immune system, or is it like a layered, you know, set of compu you know, uh, arithmetic computations? What we have all these metaphors and they're fun, um, but that's not real science uh, per se. There is neuroscience, that's not neuroscience. All right, that, that's, that's like the Greeks speculating about how to get to the moon, fun, right? And I think that I like to say this fairly strongly because I think a lot of young people think we're on the verge because a lot of people who don't talk about it clearly let it be understood that yes, we kind of, this is brain inspired, we're kind of close, uh, you know, breakthroughs are on the horizon. And unscrupulous people sometimes who need money for their labs. Um, that's not even say unscrupulous, but people will oversell. Um, I need money for my lab. I'm gonna. I'm studying you know computational neuroscience. Um, I'm gonna oversell it. And so there's been too much of that. So I'll step into the slight the gray area between metaphor and engineering. With uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, brain computer interfaces. So a company like Elon Musk has Neuralink that's working on putting electrodes in, into the brain and trying to be able to read, both read and send electrical signals. Just as you said, even the basic mechanism of communication in the brain is not something we understand. But do you hope without understanding the fundamental principles of how the brain works, we'll be able to do something interesting at that gray area of metaphor. It's not my area. So I, I hope in the sense like anybody else hopes for some interesting things to happen yeah. from research. I would expect more something like Alzheimer's will get figured out from right. modern neuroscience. That, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of human suffering based on brain disease. And we throw things like lithium at the brain, it kind of works, no one has a clue why. And that's not quite true, but you know, mostly we don't know. And that's even just about the biochemistry of the brain and how it leads to mood swings and so on how thought emerges from that. We just, we, we were really, really completely dim. So that you might want to hook up electrodes and try to do some signal processing on that and try to find patterns, fine. You know, by all means, go for it. It's just not scientific at this point. It's just, it's so it's like kind of sitting in a satellite and watching the emissions from a city and trying to affirm things about the microeconomy, even though you don't have microeconomic concepts. 
I mean, it's really that kind of thing. And, and so, yes, can you find some signals that do something interesting or useful? Can you control a cursor uh, or mouse with your brain? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I can imagine business models based on that and even, you know, medical applications of that. But from there to understanding algorithms that allow us to really tie in deeply to the, from the, the brain to the computer, you know, I just, no, I don't agree with Elon Musk. I don't think that's even, that's not for our generation. It's not even for the century. So just uh, in the hopes of getting you to dream, uh, you've mentioned Kolmogorov and Turing might pop up. Do you think that there might be breakthroughs that will get you to sit back in five, 10 years and say, wow, Oh, I, I'm sure there will be, but I don't think that there'll be demos that impress me. Hmm. I don't think that having a computer call a restaurant and pretend to be a human is right. breakthrough. Right. And people, you know, some people present it as such. Uh, it's imitating human intelligence. It's even putting coughs <laughs> yeah. in the thing to make a bit of a PR stunt. And so, fine, that the world runs on those things too. Uh, and I don't want to diminish all the hard work and engineering that goes behind things like that and, and and the ultimate value to the human race but that's not scientific understanding and and i know the people that work on these things they are after scientific understanding you know in the meantime they've got to kind of you know the trains got to run and they got mouths to feed and they got things to do and there's nothing wrong with all that um, i would call that though just engineering and i want to distinguish that between an engineering field like electrical engineering chemical engineering that originally that originally emerged that had real principles and you really knew what you're doing and you had a little scientific understanding maybe not even complete um, so it became more predictable, and it was really gave value to human life because it was understood. And and so we have to we don't want to muddle too much these waters of uh, you know what we're able to do versus what we really can do uh, in a way that's going to impress the next. So I don't I don't need to be wowed, but I, I think that someone comes along in twenty years, a younger person who's you know, absorbed all the, uh, the the technology, and, and for them to be wowed, I think they have to be more deeply impressed. A young Kolmogorov would not be wowed by some of the stunts that you see right now coming from the big companies. The demos, but do the you demos. think the breakthroughs from Kolmogorov would be, and give this question a chance, do you think they'll be in the scientific fundamental principles arena, or do you think it's possible to have fundamental breakthroughs in engineering? Meaning, you know, I would say some of the things that Elon Musk is working with, SpaceX, and then others sort of trying to revolutionize the fundamentals of engineering, of manufacturing, of of saying, here's a problem we know how to do a demo of and actually yeah. taking it to scale. Yeah, so so there's gonna be all kinds of breakthroughs. I just don't like that terminology. I'm a scientist and I work on things day in and day out and things move along and eventually say, wow, something happened, but it's I don't like that language very much. Uh, also, I don't like to prize uh, theoretical breakthroughs over practical ones. Um, I, I tend to be more of a theoretician, and I think there's lots to do in, in that arena right now. Um, and so I wouldn't point to the Kolmogoras. I might point to the Edisons of the era, and maybe Musk is a bit more like that. But, um, you know, Musk, God bless him, also will, will say things about AI that he knows very little about. And, and, and he doesn't know what he, he, he is, you know, leads people astray when he talks about things he doesn't know anything about. Trying to program a computer to understand natural language, to be involved in a dialogue like we're having right now, that can happen in our lifetime. You could fake it, you can mimic, sort of take old sentences that humans use and retread them, but the deep understanding of language, no, it's not gonna happen. And so from that, you know, I hope you can perceive that the deeper, yet deeper kind of aspects and intelligence are not gonna happen. Now, will there be breakthroughs? You know, I think that Google was a breakthrough. I think Amazon is a breakthrough. You right. know, I think Uber is a breakthrough. You know, that bring value to human beings at scale in new, brand new ways based on data flows and, and so on. A lot of these things are slightly broken because there's not an, a kind of a engineering field that takes economic value in context of data and and at, you know planetary scale and and worries about all the externalities, the privacy. You know, we, we don't have that field, so we don't think these things through very well. But I see that as emerging, and that will be constant. That will you know, looking back from 100 years, that will be constant a breakthrough in this era, just like electrical engineering was a breakthrough in the early part of the last century, and chemical engineering was a breakthrough. So the scale, the markets that you talk about and we'll get to, uh, will be seen as sort of breakthrough. And we're in the very early days of really doing interesting stuff there. And we'll, we'll get to that, but it's just taking a quick step back. Can you give, uh, we kind of threw off the historian hat. I mean, you briefly said that uh, in the history of AI kind of mimics the history of chemical engineering. But I keep saying machine learning, you keep wanting to say AI, just to let you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I resist that. 
I don't so think this so is about AI really was John McCarthy as a, almost a philosopher saying, wouldn't it be cool if we could put thought in a computer, if we could mimic the human capability to think or put intelligence in, in some sense, into a computer. That's an interesting philosophical question. And he wanted to make it more than philosophy. He wanted to actually write down logical formula and algorithms that would do that. And that is a perfectly valid, reasonable thing to do. Yes. That's not what's happening in this era. Right. So, so the reason I keep saying AI actually, and I'd love to hear what you think about it. Machine learning has a has a very particular set of methods and tools. Maybe your version of it is that mine doesn't. No, it mine doesn't. It's very, very open. It does optimization. It does sampling. It does so systems uh, that learn is what machine learning is. Systems that learn and make decisions and make decisions. So, so it's not just pattern recognition and you know pattern. finding patterns. It's all about making decisions in real worlds and having close feedback loops. So something like symbolic AI, expert systems, reasoning systems, knowledge-based representation, all of those kinds of things, search, does that neighbor fit into what you think of as machine learning? So I don't even like the word machine learning. I think that with the field you're talking about is yeah. all about making large collections of decisions under uncertainty by large collections of entities, Yes. right? And there are principles for that yes. at that scale. You don't have to say the principles are for a single entity that's making decisions, right. a single agent or a single human. It really immediately goes to the network of decisions. Is a good word for that or no? No, there's no good words for any of this. That's kind of part of the problem. Um, so we can continue the conversation to use AI for all that. I just want to kind of raise Clarify. the flag here yep. that this is not about, we don't know what intelligence is and real intelligence. We don't know much about abstraction and reasoning at the level of humans. We don't have a clue. We're not trying to build that because we don't have a clue. Eventually it may emerge. They'll may, I don't know if there'll be breakthroughs, but eventually we'll start to get glimmers of that. It's not what's happening right now, though. okay? We're taking data, we're trying to make good decisions based on that, we're trying to do it scale, we're trying to do it economically viably, we're trying to build markets, we're trying to keep value at that scale. Um, and aspects of this will look intelligent. They will look, computers were so dumb before, they will seem more intelligent. We will use that buzzword of intelligence, so we can use it in that sense, but you know. So machine learning, uh, you can scope it narrowly as just learning from data and pattern recognition. But whatever, I, when I talk about these topics, I, maybe data science is another word you could throw in the mix. Um, it really is important that the decisions are is, as part of it. It's consequential decisions in the real world. Or am I going to have a medical operation? Am I going to drive down the street? You know, things that where there's scarcity, uh, things that impact other human beings or other you know the environment and so on. How do I do that based on data? How do I do that adaptively? How do I use computers to help those kind of things go forward? Whatever you want to call that. So let's call it AI, let's agree to call it AI, but it's, um, let's, let's not say that what the goal of that is, is intelligence. The goal of that is really good working systems at planetary scale that we've never seen before. So reclaim the word AI from the Dartmouth conference from many decades ago of the dream of human- I, I don't want to reclaim it, I want a new word. I, I new think word. it was a bad choice. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, if you read one of my little things, um, the history was basically that uh, McCarthy needed a new name because cybernetics already existed. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't like, you know, no one really liked Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener was kind of an island to himself and he felt that he had encompassed all this. And in some sense he did. You look at the language of cybernetics, it was everything we're talking about. It was control theory and signal processing and some notions of intelligence and closed feedback loops and data. It was all there. It's just not a word that lived on partly because of the, maybe the personalities. Um, but McCarthy needed a new word to say, I'm different from you. I'm not part of your, your show. I got my own. Invented this word. Um, and again, as a kind of a t t t thinking forward about the movies that would be made about it, uh, it was a great choice. But thinking forward about creating a sober academic and real world discipline, it was a terrible choice because it, it led to promises that are not true, that we understand we understand artificial perhaps, but we don't understand intelligence. It's a small tangent because you're one of the great personalities of machine learning, whatever the heck you call the field. The do you think science progresses by personalities or by the fundamental principles and theories and research that's outside of personality. Yeah, both. And, and I wouldn't say there should be one kind of personality. I have mine and I have my preferences and uh, uh, I have a kind of network around me uh, that feeds me and, and some of them agree with me and some of them disagree, but you know, all kinds of personalities are needed. Um, right now, I think the personality that it's a little too exuberant, a little bit too ready to promise the moon is, is a little bit too much in ascendance. Yeah. Um, and I do, I do think that that's, there's some good to that. It certainly attracts lots of young people to our field. But a lot of those people come in with strong misconceptions and they have to then unlearn those and then find something you know, to do. Um, and so I think there's just gotta be some you know, multiple voices and there's, I, didn't, I wasn't hearing enough of the more sober voice. 
So uh, as a continuation of a fun tangent, and speaking of vibrant personalities, uh, what would you say is the most interesting disagreement you have with Jan LeCun? So Jan's an old friend, and I just say, say that uh, I, I don't think we disagree about very much, really. Right. Uh, he and I both kind of have a let's build it kind of mentality and does it work kind of mentality and uh, kind of concrete. Um, we both speak French and we speak French more together and we have, we have a lot of, a lot in common. Um, and so, you know, if one wanted to highlight a, a, a disagreement, it's not really a fundamental one. I think it's just kind of what we're emphasizing. Um, Jan has uh, emphasized pattern recognition and uh, has emphasized prediction. All right. So, you know, um, and it's interesting to try to take that as far as you can. If you could do perfect prediction, what would that give you kind of as a thought experiment? Um, and um, I think that's um, way too limited. Um, we cannot do perfect prediction. We will never have the data sets that allow me to figure out what you're about ready to do, what question you're going to ask next. I have right. no clue. I will never know such things. Moreover, most of us find ourselves during the day in all kinds of situations we had no anticipation of that are kind of very, very that are novel in various ways. And in that moment, we want to think through what we want. And also there's gonna be market forces acting on us. Uh, I'd like to go down that street, but now it's full because there's a crane in the street. I gotta, I gotta think about that. I gotta think about what I might really want here. And I gotta sort of think about how much it costs me to do this action versus this action. I gotta think about uh, the risks involved. You know, A lot of our current pattern recognition and prediction systems don't do any risk evaluations. They have no error bars, right? I got to think about other people's decisions around me. I got to think about a collection of my decisions. Even just thinking about like a medical treatment, you know, I'm not going to take a, the prediction of a neural net about my health, or about something consequential. Am I about ready to have a heart attack because some number is over 0.7? Even if you had all the data in the world that ever been collected about heart attacks, uh, better than any doctor ever had, I'm not going to trust the output of that neural net to predict my heart attack. I'm going to want to ask what if questions around that. I'm going to want to look at some us or other possible data I didn't have, causal things. I'm going to want to have a dialogue with a doctor about things we didn't think about when we gathered the data. You know, it, I could go on and on. I hope you can see. And, and I don't. I think that if you say predictions, everything that 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 you're missing all of this stuff. Um, and so, prediction plus decision making is everything. But both of them are equally important. And so, the field has emphasized prediction. Jan, rightly so, has seen how powerful that is. But um, at the cost of people not being aware that decision-making is where the rubber really hits the road, where human lives are at stake, where risks are being taken, where you got to gather more data, you got to think about the error bars, you got to think about the consequences of your decisions on others, you got to think about the economy around your decisions, blah, 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 blah. I'm not the only one working on those, but we're a smaller tribe. Mm -hmm. And right now we're not the, the one that people talk about the most. Um, but you know, if you go out in the real world in industry, um, you know, at Amazon, I'd say half the people there are working on decision making, and the other half are doing you know the pattern recognition. It's important. And the words of pattern recognition and prediction, I think the distinction there, not to linger on words, but the distinction there is more a constrained sort of in the lab data set versus decision making is talking about consequential decisions in the real world under the messiness and the uncertainty of the real world, and just the whole of it, the whole mess of it that actually touches human beings and scale, like you said, market forces, that's the that's the distinction. Yeah, it, it helps add those that perspective, that broader perspective. Right. I mean, you're right, I totally agree. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a real prediction person, of course you want it to be in the real world. You want to predict right. real world events. I'm just saying that's not possible with just data sets, uh, that it has to be in the context of, you know, uh, strategic things that someone's doing, data they might gather, things they could have gathered, the reasoning process around data. It's not just taking data and making predictions based on the data. So one of the, the things that you're working on, I'm sure there's others working on it, but I don't hear often uh, it talked about, especially in the clarity that you talk about it, and I think it's both the most exciting and the most concerning area of AI in, in terms of decision-making. So you've talked about AI systems that help make decisions that scale in a distributed way, millions, billions of decisions, sort of markets of decisions. Can you, as a starting point, sort of give an example of a system that you think about when you're thinking about these kinds of systems? Uh, yeah, so first of all, you're, you're absolutely getting into some territory which will, I, I will be beyond my expertise and, the, and there are lots of things that are gonna be very not obvious to think about, just like, just to, uh, again, I like to think about history a little bit, but think about put yourself back in the '60s. There was kind of a banking system that wasn't computerized. Really, there was there, there was database theory emerging, and database people had to think about how do I actually not just move data around, but actual money, 
and have it be, you know, valid and have transactions at ATMs happen that are actually, you know, all valid and, and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of issues you get into when you start to get serious about sorts of things like this. Um, I like to think about as kind of almost a thought experiment to help me think uh, something simpler, which is um, the music market. And because uh, there is, uh, to first order, there is no music market in the world right now, in the con in, in our country for sure. Uh, there are uh, something called things called record companies, and they make money, uh, and they prop up a few um, really good musicians and make them superstars, and they all make huge amounts of money. Um, but there's a long tail of huge numbers of people that make lots and lots of really good music that is actually listened to by more people than the famous people. Um, um, uh, they are not in a market. They cannot have a career. They do not make money. The creators, the creators. The, the creators, the so-called influencers or whatever, <laughs> that diminishes who they are, right? So there are people who make extremely good music, especially in the hip hop or Latin world, world these days. Uh, they do it on their laptop. That's what they do um, on the weekend. Uh, and they have a, uh, a, another job during the week. And they put it up on SoundCloud or other sites. Eventually it gets streamed. It now gets turned into bits. It's not economically valuable. The, the information is lost. It gets put up there. People stream it. You, you walk around in uh, a big city, you see people with headphones all, you know, especially young kids listening to music all the time. If you look at the data, none of the, very little of the music they're listening to is, is the famous people's music. And none of it's old music. It's all the latest stuff. But the people who made that latest stuff are like some 16 year old somewhere who will never make a career out of this, who will never make money. Of course, there'll be a few counterexamples the record companies incentivized to pick out a few and, and highlight them. Long story short, there's a missing market there. There is not a consumer producer relationship at the level of the actual creative acts. Um, the pipelines and Spotify's of the world that take this stuff and stream it along, they make money off of subscriptions or advertising and those things. They're making the money, all right? And then they will offer bits and pieces of it to a few people, again, to highlight that, you know, they're, they simulate a market. Anyway, a real market would be, if you're a creator of music, that you actually are somebody who's good enough that people want to listen to you, uh, you should have the data available to you. There should be a dashboard showing a map of the United States. So in last week, here's all the places your songs were listened to. It should be transparent, um, vettable, so that if someone in, down in Providence sees that uh, you're being listened to 10,000 times in Providence, that they know that's real data, you know it's real data, they will have you come give a show down there. They will broadcast to the people who've been listening to you that you're coming. If you do this right, you could you could you know go down there and make twenty thousand dollars. You do that three times through year, you start to have a career. So in this sense, AI creates jobs. It's not about taking away human jobs; it's creating new jobs because it creates a new market. Once you've created a market, you've now connected up producers and consumers. You know the person who's making the music can say to someone who comes to their shows a lot, "Hey, I'll play your daughter's wedding for ten thousand dollars." You'll say eight thousand. They'll say nine thousand. Um, then you, you again, you you can now get an income up to a hundred thousand dollars. You're not going to be a millionaire, all right. And and now even think about really the value of music is in these personal connections. Even so much so that um, a, a young kid wants to wear a T-shirt with the, their favorite musician's signature on it, right? So if if they listen to the music on the internet, the internet should be able to provide them with a button that they push, and the merchandise arrives the next day. We can do that, right? And now, why should we do that? Well, because the kid who bought the shirt will be happy, but more the person who made the music will get the money. There's no advertising needed, right? So you could create markets between producers and consumers, take 5% cut, your company will be perfectly uh, sound, it'll go forward into the future, and it will create new markets, and that raises human happiness. Um, now, this seems like, well, this is easy. Just create this dashboard, kind of create some connections and all that. But, uh, you know, if you think about Uber or whatever, you think about the, the challenges in the real world of doing things like this. And there are actually new principles going to be needed. You're trying to create a new kind of two-way market at a different scale that's ever been done before. There's going to be, uh, you know, uh, unwanted aspects of the market. There'll be bad people. There'll be, you know, um, the data will get used in the wrong ways. You know, it'll fail in some ways. It won't deliver value. You have to think that through. Just like anyone who like ran a big auction or, you know, ran a big matching service in economics will think these things through. And so that maybe doesn't get at all the huge issues that can arise when you start to create markets, but it starts for at least uh, for me, solidify my thoughts and let, allow me to move forward in my own thinking. Yeah, so uh, I talked to, had a research at Spotify, actually, and I think their long-term goal, they've said, is to uh, have at least 1 million creators make a, make a comfortable living putting on Spotify. So in, and I think you articulate a really nice vision of uh, 
the world and the digital and the cyberspace of markets, what what do you think companies like Spotify or YouTube or Netflix can do to create such markets? Is it an AI problem? Is it an interface problem? So interface design, is it uh, some other kind of, is it an economics problem? Who, who should they hire <laughs> to solve these problems? Well, part of it's not just top down. So the Silicon Valley has this attitude that they know how to do it. They will create the system just like Google did with the search box that will be so good that they'll just, everyone will adopt yeah. that, right? Um, it's not, it's, it's, it's everything you said, but really I think missing the kind of culture, hmm. all right? So it's literally that 16 year old who's, who's able to create the songs. You don't create that as a Silicon Valley entity. You don't hire them per se, okay. right? You have to create an ecosystem in which they are wanted and that they're belong, right? And so you have to have some cre cultural credibility to do things like this. You know, Netflix, to their credit, wanted some of that sort of credibility. They created shows, you know, content. They call it content. It's such a terrible word, but it's cult it's culture, yeah. right? And so with movies, you can kind of go give a large sum of money to somebody graduating from the USC film school. Uh, it's a whole thing of its own, but it's kind of like rich white people's thing to do, you know? And, you know, American culture has not been so much about rich white people. It's been about all the immigrants, all the, Af you know, the Africans who came and brought that culture and those those rhythms and and that that to, to to this world and created this whole new thing you know American culture and and so companies can't artificially create that they can't just say hey we're here uh, we're gonna buy it up you got a partner right and um, so but anyway you know not to denigrate these companies are all trying and they should and they 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 are they, I'm sure they're asking these questions and some of them are even making an effort but it, it is it is partly a respect the culture as you are a t as a technology person you got to blend your technology with cultural. With, with cultural, uh, you know, meaning. How much of a role do you think the algorithm, so machine learning has in connecting the consumer to the creator? Sort of uh, the recommender system aspect of this. Yeah, it's a great question. I think pretty high. Recommend, you, you know, um, there's no magic in the algorithms, but a good recommender system is way better than a bad recommender system. And uh, recommender systems was a bill and dollar industry back even, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and it continues to be extremely important going forward. What's your favorite recommender system, just so we can put something? Well, whoa, just whoa, whoa, historically, whoa. I was one of the, you know, when I first went to Amazon, you know, I first didn't yeah. like Amazon because they put the book people out of business or the library, you know, the local uh, booksellers went out of business. Um, I've come to accept that there, you know, there probably are more books being sold now and more people reading them than ever before. Uh, and then lo local books or stores are coming back. So, you know, that's how economics sometimes work. You go up and you go down. Um, but uh, anyway, when I finally started going there and I bought a few books, I was really pleased to see another few books being recommended to me that I never would have thought of. Uh, and I bought a bunch of them, so they obviously had a good business model. Um, but I learned things, and I still, to this day, kind of browse using that service. Um, and I think lots of people get a lot, you know, that, that, that is a good aspect of a recommendation system. I'm learning from my peers in, a, in, a, in an indirect way. Um, and their algorithms are not meant to have them impose what we what we learn. It really is trying to find out what's in the data. Uh, it doesn't work so well for other kind of entities, but that's just the complexity of human life. Like shirts, you know, I'm not going to get recommendations on shirts, and uh, but that's 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 interesting. Uh, if you try to recommend um, uh, restaurants, it's 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 it's, di it's hard. It's hard to do it at scale, and and um, but uh, a blend of recommendation systems with other um, uh, economic ideas, uh, matchings, and so on is really, really still very open research-wise, and there's new companies that could emerge that do that well. What What do you think is going to the messy, difficult land of, say, politics and things like that that YouTube and Twitter have to deal with in terms of recommendation systems? Being able to suggest, uh, I think Facebook just launched Facebook News, so they're having uh, be, recommend the kind of news that are most likely for you to be interesting do you think this is a AI solvable, again, whatever term we want to use, do you think it's a solvable problem for machines or is it a deeply human problem that's unsolvable? Uh, so I don't even think about it at that level. I think that what's broken with some of these companies, it's all monetization by advertising. They're not, at least Facebook, Let's. I want to critique them. They didn't really try to connect a producer and a consumer in an economic way, right? No one wants to pay for anything. And so they all, you know, starting with Google and Facebook, they went back to the playbook of, you know, the, the television companies back in the day. No one wanted to pay for this signal. They will pay for the TV box, but not for the signal, at least back in the day. 
And so advertising kind of filled that gap and advertising was new and interesting and it somehow didn't take over our lives quite, all right? Fast forward, Google provides a service that people don't wanna pay for. Um, and so, so somewhat surprisingly in the 90s, they made ended up making huge amounts so they cornered the advertising market. It didn't seem like that was gonna happen, at least to me. Um, these little things on the right-hand side of the screen just did not seem all that economically interesting, but that companies had maybe no other choice. The TV market was going away and billboards and so on. Um, so they they got it. And I think that sadly that uh, Google just has, was doing so well with that and making so much money, they didn't think much more about how, wait a minute, is there a producer-consumer relationship to be set up here? Not just a, between us and the advertisers market to be created. Is there an actual market between the producer and consumer? They're the producers, the person who created that video clip, the person that made that website, the person who could make more such things, the person who could adjust it and as a function of demand, the person on the other side who's asking for different kinds of things. You know, So you see glimmers of that now, there's influencers and there's kind of a little glimmering of a market, but it should have been done 20 years ago. It should have been thought about. It should have been created in parallel with the advertising ecosystem. Uh, and then Facebook inherited that, and I think they also didn't think very much about that. So fast forward, and now they are making huge amounts of money off of advertising, and the news thing and all these clicks is just is feeding the advertising. It's all connected up to the advertising. So you want more people to click on certain things because that money flows to you, Facebook. You're very much incentivized to do that. And when you start to find it's breaking, so people are telling you, well, we're getting into some troubles. You try to adjust it with your smart AI algorithms, mm -hmm. right? And figure out what are bad clicks. Oh, maybe it shouldn't be click through rate. It should be something. I find that pretty much hopeless. It does get into all the complexity of human life. And you can try to fix it. You should. But you could also fix the whole business model. And the business model is that really, what are, are there some human producers and consumers out there? Is there some economic value to be liberated by connecting them directly? Is it such that it's so valuable that uh, people will be willing to pay for it? All right, and like micro I'm, payments, like small micro, payments. but even have to be micro. So uh, I like the example. Suppose I'm going next week. I'm going to India. Never been to India before. Right? Uh, I have a couple of days in in, in Mumbai. Um, I have no idea what to do there. Right? And I could go on the web right now and search. It's going to be kind of hopeless. I'm not going to find. You know, um, I'll have lots of advertisers in my face. Right? What I really want to do is broadcast to the world that I am going to Mumbai and have someone on the other side of a market look at me and and there's a recommendation system there. So they're not looking at all possible people coming to Mumbai. They're looking at the people who are relevant to them. So someone my age group, someone who kind of knows me in some level, um, I give up a little privacy by that, but I'm happy because what I'm going to get back is this person's going to make a little video for me or they're going to write a little two-page paper on here's the cool things that you want to do in Mumbai this week especially. Right, I'm going to look at that. I'm not going to pay a micro payment. I'm going to pay, you know, hundred dollars or whatever for that. It, it's real value. It's like journalism, um, and as a, not a subscription, it's that I'm going to pay that person in that moment. Company's going to take five percent of that, and that person has now got it. It's a gig economy, if you will. But you know, done for. In, you know, thinking about a little bit behind YouTube, there was actually people who could make more of those things. And if they were connected to a market, they would make more of those things independently. You don't have to tell them what to do. You don't have to incentivize them in any other way. Um, and so, yeah, these companies, I don't think have thought long, long and hard about that. So I, I do th distinguish on, you know, Facebook on the one side, who's just not thought about these things at all, I think, uh, thinking that AI will fix everything. Uh, and Amazon, who thinks about them all the time because they were already out in the real world. They were delivering packages to people's doors. They were, they were worried about a market. They were worried about sellers. And, you know, they worry and some things they do are great. Some things maybe not so great, but, you know, they're in that business model. And then I'd say Google sort of hovers somewhere in between. I don't, I don't think for a long, long time they, they got it. Uh, I think they probably see that YouTube is more pregnant with possibility than 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 they might have thought, and that they're probably heading that direction. Um, but uh, it's, you know, Silicon Valley has been dominated by the Google Facebook kind of mentality and the subscription and advertising, and that is that's the core problem, right? The, the fake news actually rides on top of that because it it means that you're monetizing with click through rate, and that is the core problem. You got to remove that. So advertisement. We're going to linger on that. I mean, that's an interesting thesis. I don't know if everyone really deeply thinks about that. So th you're right. The thought is the advertisement model is the only thing we have, the only thing we'll ever have. So we have to fix, we have to build algorithms that despite that business model, you know, find the better angels of our nature and do good by society and by the individual. But you think we can slowly, you think, first of all, there's a difference between should and could. 
So you're saying we should slowly move away from the advertising model and have a direct connection between the consumer and the creator. The the question I also have is, can we? Because the advertising model is so successful now in terms of just making a huge amount of money and therefore being able to build a big company that provides, has really smart people working that create a good service. Do you think it's possible? And just to clarify, you think we should move away? Well, I think we should, yeah. But uh, we is, uh, you know, me. So Society. Uh, yeah, well, the companies. Um, I mean, so first of all, full disclosure, I'm doing a day a week at Amazon because I kind of want to learn more about how they do things. So, you know, I'm not speaking for Amazon in any way, but, um, I, you know, I did go there because I actually believe they get a little bit of this or trying to create these markets. And they don't really use, uh, advertisement is not a crucial part of it. Well, that's a good question. So it, it has become not crucial, but it's become more and more present if you go to Amazon website. And, uh, with, you know, without revealing too many deep secrets about Amazon, I can tell you that, you know, a lot of people in the company question this and, and there's a huge questioning going on. You do not want a world where there's zero advertising. That actually is a bad world, okay? So here's a way to think about it. You're um, a company that, like Amazon, is trying to bring products to customers, right? And the customer, at any given moment, you want to buy a vacuum cleaner, say. You want to know what's available for me. And, you know, it's not going to be that obvious. You have to do a little bit of work at it. The recommendation system will sort of help, right? But now suppose this other person over here has just made the world, you know, they spent a huge amount of energy. They had a great idea. They made a great vacuum cleaner. They know. They they really did it. They nailed it. It's an MIT you know, whiz kid that made a great new vacuum cleaner. All right? It's not going to be in the recommendation system. No one will know about it. The algorithms will not find it. And AI will not fix that Okay, at all. Right? How do you allow that vacuum cleaner to start to get in front of people be sold? Well, advertising. And here what advertising is, it's a signal that you're, you believe in your product enough that you're willing to pay some real money for it. And to me as a consumer, I look at that signal and I say, well, first of all, I know these are not just cheap little ads because we have now right now. They're, I know that, you know, these are super cheap, you know, pennies. Uh, if I see an ad where it's actually, I know the company is only doing a few of these and they're making, you know, real money is kind of flowing. And I see an ad, I may pay more attention to it. And I actually might want that mm -hmm. because I see, hey, that guy spent money on his vacuum cleaner. Uh, oh, maybe there's something good there. So I will look at it. And, and so that's part of the overall information flow in a good market. Uh, so advertising has a role. Um, but the problem is, of course, it, that that signal is now completely gone because it just, you know, dominated by these tiny little things that add up to big money for the company. You know, so I, I think it will just, I think it will change because the societies just don't, you know, stick with things that annoy a lot of people. And advertising currently annoys people more than it provides information. So and I think that a Google probably is smart enough to figure out that this is a dead, this is a bad model even though it's a hard, huge amount of money and they'll have to figure out how to pull it away from it slowly. And I'm sure the CEO there will figure it out, but um, they need to do it and uh, they need to, to uh, so if you reduce advertising, not to zero, but you reduce it at the same time you bring up producer, consumer, actual real value being delivered, so real money is being paid and they take a 5% cut, that 5% could start to get big enough to cancel out the lost revenue from the, the kind of the poor kind of advertising. And I think that a good company will, will do that, will realize that. Um, and there are, comp you know, Facebook, you know, again, God bless them. They, they bring, you know, grandmothers, uh, you know, uh, they bring children's pictures into grandmother's lives. It's fantastic. Um, but they need to think of a new business model and, and they, that's, that's the core problem there. Um, until they start to connect producer consumer, I think they will just, just continue to make money and then buy the next social network company and then buy the next one. And the innovation level will not be high and the health the health issues will not go away. So I apologize that we kind of returned to words. I, I don't think the exact terms matter, but in sort of defense of advertisement, don't you think the kind of direct connection between consumer and uh, creator, producer is the best, like the, is what, advertisement strives to do, right? So at its best advertisement is literally now, Facebook is listening to our conversation and heard that you're going to India and will be able to actually start automatically for you making these connections and start giving this offer. So like, uh, I apologize if it's just a matter of terms, uh, but just to draw a distinction, is it possible to make advertisement just better and better and better algorithmically to where it, it actually becomes a connection, almost a direct connection? That's a connection. good question. So let's put on that, push on that. First of all, I, I, what we just talked about, I was defending advertising, okay? So I was defending it as a way to get signals into a market that don't come any other way, especially algorithmically. It's a sign that someone spent money on it. It's a sign they think it's valuable. 
And if I think that if other things, someone else thinks it's valuable, then if I trust other people, I might be willing to listen. I don't trust that Facebook though, is who's an intermediary between this. I don't think they care about me, okay? I don't think they do. And I find it creepy that they know I'm going to India next week because of our conversation. Why do you think that is? Can we, so what, can you just uh, put your PR hat on? <laughs> Why do you think you find Facebook uh, creepy and not trust them as, as do majority of the population? So they're uh, out of the Silicon Valley companies, I saw like uh, not approval rate, but there's there's ranking of how much people trust companies and Facebook is in, in the gutter. In the gutter, including people inside of Facebook. <laughs> okay, so what what, uh, what do you attribute that to? Because when Come I- Come on, you don't find it creepy that right now we're talking that I might walk out on the street right now that some unknown person who I don't know kind of comes up to me and says, I hear you're going to India. I mean, I, that's not even Facebook. That's just, a, if, if I, I want transparency in human society. I want to have, if you know something about me, there's actually some reason you know something about me. That's something that if I look at it later and audit it kind of, I, I approve. You know something about me because uh, you care in some way. There's a caring relationship even, or an economic one or something. Right. Not just that you're someone who could exploit it in ways I don't know about or care about or, or I'm troubled by or, or whatever. And but we're in a, a world right now where that happens way too much. And that Facebook knows things about a lot of people and could exploit it and does exploit it at times. I think most people do find that creepy. It's not for them. It's not, it's not that it, Facebook does not doing it because they care about them, right? In, in any real sense. And they shouldn't, they should not be a big brother caring about us. That is not the role of a company like that. Why not? Right? Wait, uh, not the big brother part, but the yeah. caring, the trusting. I mean, don't those companies, just to linger on it, because a lot of companies have a lot of information about us. I, I would argue that there's companies like Microsoft that has more information about us than Facebook does, and yet we yeah. trust Microsoft more. Well, Microsoft is pivoting. Microsoft, you know, under Satya Nadella has decided this is really important. We, we don't want to do creepy things. Really want people to trust us to actually only use information in ways that they really would approve of, that we don't decide, right? And... Um, I'm just kind of adding that the health the health of a market is that uh, when I connect to someone who producer consumer, it's not just a random producer consumer. It's pe people who see each other. They don't like each other, but they sense that if they transact, some happiness will go up on both sides. If a company helps me to do that in moments that I choose of my choosing, um, then fine. So, and also think about the difference between you know browsing versus buying, right? There are moments in my life, I just want to buy you know, a gadget or something. I need something for that moment. I need some ammonia for my house or something because I got a problem, a spill. Um, I want to just go in. I don't want to be advertised at, at that moment. I don't want to be led down very, you know, that's annoying. I want to just go and have it be extremely easy to do what I want. Um, uh, other moments I might say, no, I'm, it's like in the, today I'm going to the shopping mall. I want to walk around and see things and see people and be exposed to stuff. So I want control over that though. I don't want the company's algorithms to decide for me, right? And I think that's the thing. We, it's a total loss of control. If Facebook thinks they should take the control from us of deciding when we want to have certain kinds of information, when we don't, what information that is, how much it relates to what they know about us that we didn't really want them to know about us. They're not, I don't want them to be helping me in that way. I don't want them to be helping them by they decide that they have control over um, um, what I want and when. I totally agree. So, so Facebook, by the way, I have this optimistic thing where I think Facebook has the kind of personal information about us that could create a beautiful thing. So I, I'm really optimistic of what Facebook could do. Uh, it's not what it's doing, but what it could do. So I don't see that. I think that optimism is misplaced because there's not a bit, you have to have a business model behind these things. Cre yes, no, create create to, a beautiful thing is yeah. really, let's be, let's be clear. It's about so, something that people would value. And and I don't think they have that business model. And I don't okay. think they, they will suddenly discover it by what, you know, by a long, hot shower. I disagree. I disagree in terms of uh, a sh you can discover a lot of amazing things in, in a shower. So <laughs> I didn't say that. I said they won't come. They won't. They won't do it but, uh, <laughs> in the shower. I think a lot of other people will discover it. I think that this guy, so I, I should also, uh, full disclosure, there's a company called United Masters, which I'm on their board, and they've yes. created this music market. Yes. And they have 100,000 artists now signed on. And they've done things like gone to the NBA. And the NBA, the music you find behind NBA Eclipse right now is their music. Right. That's a company that had a, the right business model in mind from the get-go, right? Executed on that. And, and from day one, there was value brought to, so here, here you have a kid who made some songs who suddenly their songs are on the NBA website, right? right. 
that that's real economic value to people and uh so you know so you and i differ on the optimism of being able to sort of uh um change the direction of the titanic right mm -hmm. uh, so i yeah <laughs> i'm older than you so i've seen some titanics crash <laughs> got it but uh so and just to elaborate, because I, I totally agree with you, and I just want to know how difficult you think this problem is. Of so, for example, I um, I want to read some news, and I would. There's a lot of times in the day where something makes me either smile or think in a way where I like consciously think this really gave me value. Like I sometimes listen to uh, the daily podcast in the New York Times, way better than the New York Times themselves, by the way for people listening. That's like real journalism is happening for some reason in the podcast space. It doesn't make sense to me. But often I listen to it 20 minutes and I, I would be willing to pay for that, like $5, $10 for yeah, that experience. No, absolutely. And how difficult, that's kind of what you're getting at is that little transaction. What, how difficult is it to create a frictionless system like Uber has, for example, for other things? What's your intuition there? Uh, so I, first of all, I, I pay little bits of money to, you know, to there's something called Quartz that does financial things. I like Medium as a site. I don't pay there, but um, I would. You where, had a great post on Medium. I would have loved to pay you a dollar and but I wouldn't have wanted others. it. I wouldn't have wanted it per se because um, there should be also sites where that's not actually the goal. The goal is to actually have a broadcast channel that I monetize in some other way if I chose to. Right. I mean, I could now. People know about it. I could. I'm not doing it, but um, that that's fine with me. There, also, the musicians who are making all this music, I, I don't think the right model is that you pay a little subscription fee to them, all right? Because because people can copy the bits too easily, and it's just not that. somewhere the value is. The value is that a connection was made with real, between real human beings, then you can follow up on that, all right, and create yet more value. So, no, I, I think... Um, um, so there's a lot of open questions here. A lot of open quick. questions, but also, yeah, I do want good recommendation systems that recommend cool stuff to me, and, but it's pretty hard, right? I, I don't like them to recommend stuff just based on my browsing history. I don't like them to based on stuff they know about me, quote, unquote. What's unknown about me is the most interesting. So that, right? this, is the, this is the really interesting question. We may disagree, maybe not. I think that I love recommender systems and I want to give them everything about me in a way that I trust. Yeah, but you but you don't because so for example this morning I clicked on I you know I was pretty sleepy this morning um, I clicked on a, a story about the Queen of England yes right I do not give a damn about the Queen of England I really do not but it was clickbait it kind of looked funny yeah. and I had yeah. to say what the heck are they talking about there yeah. I don't want to have my life you know heading that direction now that's in my browsing history the system in any reasonable system will think that's that browsing I care about history. The Queen of Right, but but you're saying all the trace, all the digital exhaust or whatever, that's been kind of the model is if you collect all this stuff, you're going to figure all of us out. Well, if you're trying to figure out like kind of one person, like Trump or something, maybe you could figure him out. But if you're trying to figure out, you know, 500 million people, you know, no way, no way. You think so? You no, think I do. I think so. I think we are, humans are just amazingly rich and complicated. Every one of us has our little quirks. Every one of us has our little things that could intrigue us that we don't even know and will intrigue us. And there's no sign of it in our past. But by God, there it comes, and and exactly. you know you fall in love with it. And I don't want a company trying to figure that out for me and anticipate that. Okay, well, let me I want them to provide a forum, a, a market, a place that I kind of go and by hook or by crook, this happens. You know, I, I'm walking down the street and I hear some Chilean music being played, and I never knew I liked Chilean music. But wow! So there is that side, and I want them to provide a, a limited but you know interesting place to go, right? And so don't try to use your AI to kind of you know, figure me out and then put me in a world where you figured me out, you know, no, create huge spaces for human beings where our creativity and our style will be enriched and come forward. And it'll be a lot of more transparency. I won't have people randomly anonymously putting comments up and I'll special based on stuff they know about me, facts that, you know, we are so broken right now. If you're, you're you know, especially if you're a celebrity, but you know, it's about anybody that, uh, anonymous people are hurting lots and lots of people right now. And that's part of this thing that Silicon Valley is thinking that, you know, just collect all this information and use it in a, in a great way. So, no, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist, but I'm very much an optimist by nature, but I think that's just been the wrong path for the whole technology to take. Uh, be more limited, uh, create, let humans r rise up. Don't, don't try to replace them. That's the AI mantra. Don't try to anticipate them. Don't try to predict them. Because you're 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 not gonna you're not gonna be do those, do those things. You're gonna make things worse. Okay, so 
right now, just give this a chance. Uh, right now, the recommender systems are the creepy people in the shadow watching your every move. So they're looking at traces of you. They're not directly interacting with you. Sort of the, the, your close friends and family, the way they know you is by having conversation, by actually having interactions back and forth. Do you think there's a place for recommender systems sort of to step, because you, you just emphasize the value of human to human connection, but yeah. just give it a chance, AI human connection. Is there a role for an AI system to have conversations with you yeah. in terms of, to try to figure out what kind of music you like, not by just watching what you listen yeah, to, but right. actually having a conversation, natural language or otherwise. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, so I'm not against any of this. I just wanted to push back against the, maybe you, you're saying uh, you have options for Facebook. So I, there, I yeah. think it's misplaced, but, but um, I think that I'm the distributing- one guy defending Facebook. <laughs> yeah, no, so good for you. <laughs> uh, go for it. That's a hard spot to be. Yeah, in. no, good. Human interaction, like on our daily, the context around me in my own home is something that I don't want some big company to know about at all, but I would be more than happy to have technology help me with it. Which kind of technology? Well, what, you know, just- Alexa, Amazon. Uh, uh, well, a good, you know, Alexa's done right. I think Alexa's a research platform right now more than anything else, but Alexa done right, you know, could do things like I uh, I leave the water running in my garden and I say, hey, Alexa, the water's running in my garden. Um, and even have Alexa figure out that that means when my wife comes home that she should be told about that. That's a little bit of a reasoning. I would call that AI. And by any kind of stretch, it's a little bit of reasoning. And it actually kind of would make my life a little easier and better. And, you know, I don't, I wouldn't call this a wow moment, but I kind of think that overall rises human, human happiness up to have that kind of thing. Um, but not when you're lonely. Alexa knowing loneliness no, Sadness, no, there, I don't want Alexa fear. to be feel intrusive and I, I, and I don't want just the designer of the system to kind of work all this out. I really want to have a lot of control and I want transparency and control. And if the company can stand up and give me that in the context of new technology, um, I think they're gonna first of all be way more successful than our current generation. And like I said, I was mentioning Microsoft earlier on, I really think uh, they're, they're pivoting to kind of be the trusted old uncle. But you know, I think that they get that this is a way to go, that if you let people, find technology empowers them to have more control and have and have control, not just over privacy, but over this rich set of interactions, um, that, that people are gonna like that a lot more. And that's that's the right business model going forward. What does control over privacy look like? Do you think you should be able to just view all the data that- you No, it's much more than that. I mean, first of all, it should be an individual decision. Some people don't want privacy. They want their whole life out there. Other people right. want it. Um, uh, privacy is not a zero one. It's not a legal thing. It's not just about which data is available and which is not. Um, I like to re recall to people that, you know, a couple hundred years ago, everyone, there was not really big cities. Everyone lived in the countryside in villages. Um, and in villages, everybody knew everything about you. Very, you didn't have any privacy. Is that bad? Are we better off now? Well, you know, arguably no, because what did you get for that loss of at least certain kinds of privacy? Um, well, uh, people helped you, each other if they because they know everything about you. They know something's bad's happening. They will help you with that, right? And now you live in a big city. No one knows the amount of you. Get no help. Um, so uh, it kind of depends. Is the answer I want certain people uh, who I trust and there should be relationships. I should kind of manage all those. But who, who knows what about me? I should have some agency there. It shouldn't. I shouldn't just be adrift in a sea of technology where I have, I have no agency. And I don't want to go reading things and checking boxes. Uh, so I don't know how to do this, and I'm not a privacy researcher per se. I just I recognize the vast complexity of this. It's not just technology. It's not just law, legal scholars meeting technologists. Uh, it, there's got to be kind of whole layers around it. And so I, I, when I allude to this emerging engineering field, this is a big part of it. Um, like when electrical engineering come came, I'm not wasn't around at the time, but uh, you just didn't plug electricity, you know, into walls and it all kind of worked. You don't have to have like, you know, underwriters laboratory that reassured you that that plug's not going to burn up your house and that that machine will do this and that and everything. There'll be whole people who can install things. There'll be people who can watch the installers. There'll be a whole layers, you know, an onion of these kind of things. And for things as deeply interesting as privacy, which is as least as interesting as electricity, um, that, that's going to take decades to kind of work out, but it's going to require a lot of new structures that we don't have right now. So it's kind of even hard to talk about it. And you're saying there's a lot of money to be made if you get it right. So absolutely, should look at a lot of money to be made in all these things that provide human services and people recognize them as useful parts uh, uh, you know, of their lives. Uh, so yeah, um, so yeah, the dialogue sometimes goes from the exuberant technologists uh, to the no technology is good kind of, and that's you know in our public discourse, you know, in, in news stories, you see too much of this kind of thing. And the, and the sober discussions in the middle, which are the challenging ones to have, are where we need to be having our conversations. And you know, there's just not actually there's not many forum fora for those. Um, 
you know, there's that's that's kind of what I would look for. Maybe I could go and I could read a comment section of something, and it would actually be this kind of dialogue going yeah. back and forth. You don't see much of this, right? Which is why actually there's a resurgence of podcasts out of all because Good. people are really hungry for conversation. Yeah, but there's technology is not helping much. So comment sections of anything, including YouTube, yeah, is or not hurting. Hurting, are not hurting. Hurting. Not hurting. helping. Yeah. And you think, technically speaking, it's possible to help. I, I don't know the answers, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a less anonymity, a little more locality, um, you know, worlds that you kind of enter in and you trust the people there in those worlds so that when you start having yeah. a discussion, you know, not only is that people not gonna hurt you, but it's not gonna be a total waste of your time because there's a lot of wasting of time that, you know, a lot of us, I, I pulled out of Facebook early on because it was clearly gonna waste a lot of my time, even yeah. though there was some value. Um, and so, yeah, worlds that are somehow you enter in, and you know what you're getting, and it's kind of appeals to you. You might new things might happen, but you kind of have some some trust in that world. And there's some deep, interesting, complex psychological aspects around anonymity, uh, how that changes human behavior. That's Indeed. quite dark and, and quite uh, dark. Yeah, I think a lot of us are, uh, who, especially those of us who really loved the advent of technology. I loved social networks when they came out. I was just, I didn't see any negatives there at all. But then I started uh, seeing comment sections. I think it was maybe you know with the CNN or something, mm -hmm. uh, and I started going, "Wow, this this darkness! I just did not know about." And um, and our technology is now amplifying it. Um, so sorry for the big philosophical question, but on that topic, do you think human beings? Because you've also, out of all things, had a foot in psychology too. Uh, the do you think human beings are fundamentally good? Like all of us have good intent that could be mined or is it depending on context and environment everybody could be evil so I, my answer is fundamentally good um but fundamentally limited all of us have very you know blinkers on we don't see the other person's pain that easily we don't see the other person's point of view that easily we're very much in our own head in our own world um and on my, my good days i think the technology could open us up to you know more perspectives and more less blinkered and more understanding you know, a lot of wars in human history happened because of just ignorance. They didn't. They they thought the other person was doing this, while well, the other person wasn't doing this, and we have huge amounts of that. Um, but in my lifetime, I've not seen technology really help in that way yet, and I do I, I do I do believe in that. But you know, no, I think fundamentally humans are good. People suffer. People have grievances. People have grudges, and those things cause them to do things they probably wouldn't want. They regret it often. Um, so no, I, I I think it's a you know part of the progress of technology is to indeed allow it to be a little easier to be the real good person you actually are. <laughs> well put. Do you think individual human life or society can be modeled as an optimization problem? Um, not the way I think typically. I mean, that's you're talking about the, one of the most complex phenomena in the whole you know in all of the which universe. the individual human life or society as a whole. Both. Both. I mean, individual human life is is amazingly complex, and um, so uh, you know, optimization is kind of just one branch of mathematics that talks about certain kind of things, and uh, it just it feels way too limited for the complexity of uh, such things. What properties of optimization problems do you think? So, do you think most interesting problems that could be solved through optimization? Uh, what kind of properties does that surface have? Non convexity convexity, linearity, all those kinds of things, saddle points. Well, so optimization is just one piece of mathematics. You know, there's like, you just, even in our era, we're aware that say sampling um, is coming up with examples of something, um, coming what's, up with a distribution. What's optimization, what's sampling? Well, you, they, you can, if you're a kind of a certain kind of mathematician, you can try to blend them and make them see, seem to be sort of the same thing. But optimization is roughly speaking, trying to, uh, find a point that um, a single point that is the uh, optimum of a criterion function of some kind, um, and sampling is trying to from that same surface treat that as a distribution or density and find prop points that have high density. So um, I, I want the entire distribution in a sampling paradigm, and I want the uh, you know the the single point that's the best point in the in the sample in the uh, optimization paradigm. Now, if you were optimizing in the space of probability measures. The output of that could be a whole probability distribution. So you can start to make these things the same. But in mathematics, if you go too high up that kind of abstraction arc, you start to lose the uh, you know the ability to do the interesting theorems. So you kind of don't try to you don't try to overly over abstract. So as a small tangent, what kind of worldview do you find more appealing? One that is 
deterministic or stochastic? Uh, st well, that's statistic. easy. I mean, I'm a statistician. You know, the, the world is highly stochastic. We, I don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes, right? What you're going to ask, what we're going to do, what, due what, to what I'll say. Due to the uncertainty. Due to the massive uncertainty. Yeah. You know, massive uncertainty. And so the best I can do is have come kind of rough sense or probability distribution on things and somehow use that in my reasoning about what to do now. So how does the distributed at scale when you have multi-agent systems uh, look like? So optimization can optimize sort of, it makes a lot more sense sort of, uh, at least from my, from a robotics perspective, for a single robot, for a single agent, trying to optimize some objective function. Uh, w w when you start to enter the real world, this game theoretic concept starts popping up. Uh, that, how, how do you see optimization in this? Because you've talked about markets and a scale. What does that look like? Do you see it as optimization? Do you see it as sampling? Do you see, like how, how should you model? Yeah, these all blend together. Um, and a system designer thinking about how to build an incentivized system will have a blend of all these things. So, you know, a particle in a potential well is optimizing a functional called a Lagrangian, right? The particle doesn't know that. There's no algorithm <laughs> running that does that. It okay. just happens. It's, it's, so it's a description mathematically of something that helps us understand as analysts what's happening. Right, and so the same thing will happen when we talk about you know mixtures of humans and computers and markets and so on and so forth. There'll be certain principles that allow us to understand what's happening, and whether or not the actual algorithms are being used by any sense is not clear. Um, now, at at some point, I may have set up a multi-agent or market kind of system, and I'm now thinking about an individual agent in that system, and they're asked to do some task, and they're incentivized in some way. They get certain signals, and they they have some utility. Maybe what they will do at that point is they, they just won't know the answer. They may have to optimize to find an answer. Okay, so an optimist could be embedded inside of an overall market. Uh, you know, and game theory is is very very broad. Um, it is often studied very narrowly for certain kinds of problems. Um, but it's roughly speaking, there's just the I don't know what you're going to do, so I kind of anticipate that a little bit, and then you anticipate what I'm anticipating, and we kind of go back and forth in our own minds. We run kind of thought experiments. You've talked about this interesting point in terms of uh, game theory. So, you know, most optimization problems really hate saddle points. Maybe you can describe what saddle points are, but I've heard you kind of mention that there's a, there's a branch of optimization that you could try to ex explicitly look for saddle points as a good thing. Oh, not optimization, that's just game theory. That, that, so uh, e there's all kinds of different equilibria in game theory. And some of them are highly explanatory behavior. They're, they're not attempting to be algorithmic. They're just trying to say, if you happen to be at this equilibrium, you would see certain kind of behavior. And we see that in real life. That's what an economist wants to do, especially a behavioral economist. Um, uh, in, in continuous uh, d a differential game theory, you're in continuous spaces, a, um, some of the simplest equilibria are saddle points. A Nash equilibrium is a saddle point. It's a special kind of saddle point. So you know, classically in game theory, you were trying to find Nash equilibria. And in algorithmic game theory, you're trying to find algorithms that would find them. Uh, and so you're trying to find saddle points. I mean, so that's, that's literally what you're trying to do. Um, but you know, any economist knows that Nash equilibria uh, have their limitations. They are definitely not that explanatory in many situations. They're not what you really want. Um, there's other kind of equilibria, and there's names associated with these because they came from history with certain people working on them, but there will be new ones emerging. So, you know, one example is a Stackelberg equilibrium. So, you know, Nash, you and I are both playing this game against each other or for each other, maybe it's cooperative, and we're both going to think it through, and then we're going to decide and we're going to off, you know, do our thing to, simultaneously. You know, in a Stackelberg, no, I'm going to be the first mover. I'm going to make a move. You're going to look at my move, and then you're going to make yours. Now, since I know you're going to look at my move, I anticipate what you're going to do, and so I don't do something stupid. But and, and but then I know that you are also anticipating me, so we're kind of going back and forth in our mind. But there is then a first mover thing, and so there is a those are different equilibria, all right. And uh, so just mathematically, yeah, these things have certain topologies, certain shapes that are like saddle points, and then algorithmically or dynamically, how do you move towards them? How do you move away from things? Um, you know, so some of these questions have answers, they've been studied, uh, others do not, and especially if it becomes stochastic, uh, especially if there's large numbers of right. decentralized things, there's just, uh, you know, young people getting in this field who kind of think it's all done because we have, you know, TensorFlow. <laughs> well, no, these are all open problems and they're really important and interesting. And it's about strategic settings. How do I collect data? Suppose I don't know what you're gonna do because I don't know you very well. 
Mm -hmm. right? Well, I got to collect data about you. So maybe I want to push you in a part of the space where I don't know much about you so I can get data. Cause, and then later I'll realize that I, you'll never, you'll never go there because of the way the game is set up. But you know, that's part of the overall, you know, data analysis context. Is it. Yeah, even the game of poker is fascinating space. Hey, yeah. whenever, whenever there's any uncertainty or lack of information, it's, it's a super exciting space. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, linger on optimization for a second. So if we look at deep learning, it's essentially minimization of a complicated loss function. So is there something insightful or hopeful that you see in the kinds of function surface that loss functions, the deep learning in, in the real world is trying to optimize over? Is there something interesting? Is it just the usual kind of problems of optimization? I think from an optimization point of view, that surface, first of all, it's, it's pretty smooth. Um, and secondly, if there's over, if it's over-parameterized, there's kind of lots of paths down to reasonable optima. Yep. Uh, and so kind of the getting downhill to the uh, to an optimum is, is viewed as not as hard as you might've expected in high dimensions. The fact that some optima tend to be really good ones and others not so good, and you tend to, it's not, sometimes you find the good ones is, is sort of still needs explanation. Yeah, it's a, but it's a but the mystery. particular surfaces coming from the particular generation of neural nets, I kind of suspect those will dis those will change. Right. In ten years, it will not be exactly those surfaces. There'll be some others that are, and optimization theory will help contribute to why other surfaces or why other algorithms. Layers of arithmetic operations with a little bit of nonlinearity. That's not that didn't come from neuroscience per se. I mean, maybe in the minds of some of the people working on it, they were thinking even about brains, but. Uh, they were arithmetic circuits in all kinds of fields, you know, uh, computer science, control theory, and so on. And that layers of these could transform things in certain ways. And that uh, if it's smooth, maybe you could, uh, you know, find parameter values. Um, you know, is a big is is a is a, is a sort of big discovery that it's it's working. It's able to, to work at this scale. But um, in, um, in terms, I don't of think that'll we're stuck with that, and we're we're certainly not stuck with that because we're understanding the brain. So in terms of uh, on the algorithm side, sort of gradient descent, do you think we're stuck with gradient descent as, as uh, variants of it? What variants do you find interesting? Or do you think there'll be something else invented that uh, is able to walk all over these optimization spaces in more interesting ways? So there's a co-design of the surface and the, or the architecture and the algorithm. Um, so if you just ask if we stay with the kind of architectures we have now, not just neural nets, but you know, phase retrieval architectures or matrix completion architectures and so on. Um, you know, I think we've kind of come to a place where, yeah, a, a stochastic gradient algorithms are dominant and um, there are versions uh, that, you know, that are a little better than others. They, you know, have more guarantees, they're more robust and, and so on. And there's ongoing research to kind of figure out which is the best arm for which situation. Um, but I think that that'll start to co-evolve, that that'll put pressure on the actual architecture. And so we shouldn't do it in this particular way. We should do it in a different way because this other algorithm is now available if you do it in a different way. Um, so uh, that, that, that I can't that I really anticipate that co-evolution process. But, I, you know, gradients are amazing uh, mathematical objects. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, have a lot of people who uh, start to study them more deeply mathematically uh, are kind of shocked about what, what they are and what they can do. Um, I mean, think about it this way: If uh, suppose that I tell you, if you move along the x-axis, you get, uh, uh, you know, you go uphill in some objective by, uh, you know, three units. Whereas if you move along the y-axis, you go uphill by uh, seven units. Right now, I'm going to only allow you to move a certain, you know, unit distance. All right, what are you going to do? Well, the most not people will say that I'm going to go along the y-axis. I'm getting the biggest bang for my buck, mm -hmm. you know, and my buck is only one unit, so I'm going to put all of it in the y-axis. Right. And uh, why should I even take any of my strength, my step size, and put any of it in the x-axis because I'm getting less bang for my buck? That seems like a completely uh, you know, clear, clear argument, and it's wrong because the gradient direction is not to go along the y-axis. It's to take a little bit of the x-axis. Uh, and that, to understand that, you have to, you have to know some math. And um, so even a, a you know, trivial so-called so operator like a gradient is not trivial. And so you know, exploiting its properties is still very, very important. Um, now we know that just pervading descent has got all kinds of problems. It gets stuck in many ways and it had not have you know, good dimension dependence and so on. So um, my own line of work recently has been about what kinds of stochasticity, how can we get dimension dependence? How can we do the theory of that? Um, and we've come up pretty favorable results with certain kinds of stochasticity. We have sufficient conditions generally. We we know if you if you do this, we will give you a good guarantee. 
Uh, we don't have necessary conditions that it must be done a certain way in general. So stochasticity, how much randomness to inject into the yeah. into the walking along the gradient. And what kind of randomness? Why is randomness good in this process? Why is stochasticity good? Yeah, so um, I, I can give you simple answers, but in some sense, again, it's kind of amazing. Stochasticity just, uh, um, you know, particular features of a surface that could have hurt you if you were doing one thing you know, deterministically won't hurt you because, uh, you know, by chance, you know, there's very little chance that you would get hurt. And, um, you know, so here stochasticity, um, you know, it just kind of saves you from some of the particular features of surfaces that, um, you know, and, and in fact, if you think about, uh, you know, surfaces that are discontinuous in a first derivative, like, you know, an absolute value function, um, you will go down and hit that point where there's non-differentiability, right? And if you're running a deterministic algorithm, at that point, you can really do something bad, mm -hmm. right? Where stochasticity just means it's pretty unlikely that's going to happen, that you're going you're gonna to hit that point. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's, again, not trivially analyzed, but um, yeah, especially in higher dimensions, also stochasticity, our intuition isn't very good about it, but it has properties that kind of are very appealing in high dimensions for kind of law of large number reasons. Um, so it's it's all part of the mathematics to kind of that's what's fun to work in the field is that you get to try to understand this mathematics and, and um, but long story short you know uh, partly empirically it was discovered stochastic gradient is very effective and theory mm -hmm. kind of followed I'd say um, that but I don't see that we're getting clearly out of that. Uh, what's the most beautiful, mysterious, or profound idea to you in optimization? I don't know the most, I'm, I'm, uh, but let me just say that uh, you know Nesterov's work on Nesterov acceleration to me is uh, pretty pretty surprising and pretty deep. Um, Can you elaborate? Well, Nesterov acceleration is just that. Um, uh, suppose that we are uh, going to use gradients to move around in space for the reasons I've alluded to. There, there, there are nice directions to move. And suppose that I tell you that you're only allowed to use gradients. You're not going to be allowed to. You see this local person that can only sense kind of the change in, in, in the surface. Um, but I'm going to give you kind of a computer that's able to store all your previous gradients. And so you start to learn some, something about the, the surface. Um, and I'm going to restrict you to maybe move in the direction of uh, like a linear span of all the gradients. So you can't kind of just move in some arbitrary direction, right? So now we have a well-defined mathematical complexity model. There's a certain classes of algorithms that can do that and others that can't. And we can ask for certain kinds of surfaces, how fast can you get down to the optimum? So there's an answers to these. So for a, you know, a, a smooth uh, convex function, there's an answer, which is one over the number of steps squared. Mm -hmm. is that you will be within a ball of that size uh, um, after, after k steps. Um, gradient descent in particular has a slower rate. It's one over k, okay? Um, so you could ask, is gradient descent actually, even though we know it's a good algorithm, is it the best algorithm in the sense? And the answer is no. Well, well, not clear yet because what, one over k squared is a lower bound. That's that's probably the best you can do. Mm -hmm. what, gradient is one over k, but is there something better? Mm -hmm. And so it was, I think it's a surprise to most that when Nesterov discovered a new algorithm that has uh, got two pieces to it. It uses two gradients. Um, and uh, puts those together in a certain kind of obscure way. And uh, the thing doesn't even move downhill all the time. It sometimes goes back uphill. Um, and if you're a physicist, that kind of makes some sense. You're building up some momentum. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the right intuition. But that, that intuition is not enough to understand kind of how to do it and why it works. Um, but it does. It achieves one over k squared. And uh, it has a mathematical structure. And it's still kind of, to this day, a lot of us are writing papers and trying to explore that and understand it. Um, so there are lots of cool ideas in optimization, but just kind of using gradients, I think, is number one. That goes back, you know, 150 years. Um, and then Nestrov, I think, has made a major contribution with this idea. So like you said, gradients themselves are, in some sense, mysterious. Yeah. They're not, uh, they're not as trivial as... Not as trivial. Mathematically coordinate, speaking. Coordinate descent is, is more of a trivial one. You just yes. pick one of the coordinates and That's go how down we think. One. That's how our human minds think. That's how our human minds think. And yeah. gradients are not that easy for our human mind to grapple. An absurd question, but uh, what is statistics? So the, here it's a little bit, it's somewhere between math and science and technology. It's somewhere in that convex hole. So it's, uh, it's a set of principles that allow you to make inferences that have got some reason to be believed. And also principles that allow you to make decisions where you can have some reason to believe you're not gonna make errors. 
Um, so all of that requires some assumptions about what do you mean by an error? What do you mean by you know the probabilities? And um, but you know get start, after you start making some of those assumptions, you're led to uh, conclusions that yes, I can guarantee that you 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 know if you do this in this way, your probability of making an error will be small. Um, your probability of uh, continuing to not make errors over time will be small, I, and, and uh, probability you found something that's real will be small, uh, will be high. So decision so, making is a big part. Decision of making that. is a big part. Yeah. So uh, the original, so statistics, uh, you know, short history was that you know it sort of goes back as sort of as a formal discipline, you know, 250 years or so. Um, it was called inverse probability because around that era, uh, probability was developed, sort of especially to explain gambling. Um, situations, of course, and um, interesting. So uh, you would say, well, given the state of nature is this, there's a certain roulette board that has a certain mechanism in it. Uh, what kind of outcomes do I expect to see? Uh, and um, especially if I do things long, long amounts of time, what outcomes will I see? And the physicists started to pay attention to this. Um, and then people say, well, given, uh, let's turn the problem around. What if I saw certain outcomes? Could I infer what the underlying mechanism was? That's an inverse problem. And in fact, for quite a while, statistics was called inverse probability. That was the name of the field. And I believe that uh, it was Laplace uh, who was working in Napoleon's government who was trying, who needed to do a census of France, <laughs> learn about the people there. So he went and got and gathered data and he analyzed that data to, 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 to determine policy and uh, said, well, let's call this field uh, that does this kind of thing statistics because um, the, the word state is in there. In French, that's etat, but um, you know, it's the study of data for the state. Uh, um, so anyway, that caught on, and um, it's been called statistics ever since. But um, uh, but by the time it got formalized, it was sort of in the 30s. Um, and uh, around that time, there was game theory and decision theory developed nearby. Um, people in that era didn't think of themselves as either computer science or statistics or control or econ. They were all they were all the above. And so you know, von Neumann is developing game theory, but also thinking of that as decision theory. Wald is an econometrician developing decision theory and then you know turning that into statistics. Uh, and so it's all about, here's a, here's not just data and you analyze it, here's a, a loss function, here's what you care about, here's the question you're trying to ask. Uh, here is a probability model and here's the risk you will face if you make certain decisions. Um, and to, to this day, in most advanced statistical curricula, you teach decision theory as the starting point. And then it branches out into the two branches of Bayesian and frequentist, but um, that's it's all about decisions. In statistics, what is the most beautiful, mysterious, maybe surprising idea that you've come across? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of surprising ones. There's something that's way too technical for this thing, but something called James Stein estimation, which is kind of surprising and really takes time to wrap your head around. Can you try to maybe? Nah, I think I don't want even want to try. Um, <laughs> let me just say a colleague at, uh, at Steve, uh, Stephen Stickler at University of Chicago wrote a really beautiful paper on James Stein estimation, which is, helps to, it's viewed as a paradox. It kind of defeats the mind's attempts to understand it, but you, you can, and Steve has a nice perspective on that. Um, there, uh, so one of the troubles with statistics is that it's like in physics that or in quantum physics, you have multiple interpretations. There's a wave and particle duality in physics. And you get used to that over time, but it still kind of haunts you that you don't really you know, quite understand the relationship. The electron's a wave and electron's a particle. Well, mm. um, well the same thing happens here. There's Bayesian ways of thinking and frequentist, and they are different. They, they, oft, they sometimes become sort of the same in practice, but they are philosophically different. And then in some practice, they are not the same at all. They give you rather different answers. Um, and so it is very much like wave and particle duality. And that is something you have to kind of get used to in the field. Can you define Bayesian and frequentist? Yeah, in decision theory, you can make, I have a like I have a video that people could see. It's called, are you a Bayesian or a frequentist? And kind of help try to, to, to make it really clear. It comes from decision theory. So, you know, decision theory, uh, you're talking about loss functions, which are a function of, data x and parameter theta for a function of two arguments okay neither one of those arguments is known you don't know the data a priori it's random and the parameter is unknown all right so you have this function of two things you don't know and you're trying to say i want that function to be small i want small loss mm -hmm. right well um what are you going to do so you sort of say well i'm going to average over these quantities or maximize over them or something so that you know uh, i turn that uncertainty into something certain um, 
So you could look at the first argument and average over it, or you could look at the second argument and average over it. That's Bayesian frequentist. So the, the frequentist says, I'm going to look at the X, the data, and I'm going to take that as random, and I'm going to average over the distribution. So I take the expectational loss under X. Theta is held fixed, mm -hmm. right? That's called the risk. And so it's looking at mm -hmm. other all the data sets you could get, right? And saying, how well will a certain procedure do under all those data sets? That's called a frequentist guarantee, right? So I think of this very appropriate when like you're building a piece of software and you're shipping it out there and people are gonna use it on all kinds of data sets. You wanna have a stamp, a guarantee on it that as people run it on many, many data sets that you never even thought about that 95% of the time it will do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, perfectly reasonable. Uh, the Bayesian perspective says, well, no, I'm gonna look at the other argument of the loss function, the theta part, okay? That's unknown and I'm uncertain about it. So I could have uh, my own personal probability for what it is. You know, how many tall people are there out there? I'm trying to infer the average height of the population. Well, I have an idea of roughly what the, the height is. So I'm gonna average over the, um, the, the theta. So now that loss function has only now, again, one argument's gone. Now it's a function of X. And that's what a Bayesian does is they say, well, let's just focus on the particular X we got, the data set we got. We condition on that. Conditional on the X, I say something about my loss. That's a Bayesian approach to things. And the Bayesian uh, will argue that it's not relevant to look at all the other data sets you could have gotten and average over them, the frequentist approach. It's really only the data set you got, all right? And I do agree with that especially in situations where you're working with a scientist, you can learn a lot about the domain and you're really only focused on certain kinds of data and you gathered your data and you make inferences. Um, I don't agree with it though, that it, you know, in the sense that there are needs for frequentist guarantees. You're writing software, people are using it out there, you wanna say something. So these two things have to got to fight each other a little bit, but they have to blend. So long story short, there's a set of ideas that are right in the middle. They're called empirical bays. And empirical bays sort of starts with the Bayesian framework uh, it's it's uh, kind of arguably philosophically more, you know, reasonable and kosher. Write down a bunch of the math that kind of flows from that and then realize there's a bunch of things you don't know because it's the real world and you don't know everything. So you're uncertain about certain quantities. At that point, ask, is there a reasonable way to plug in an estimate for those things? Okay. And in some cases, there's quite a reasonable thing to do um, to plug in. There's a natural thing you can observe in the world that you can plug in and then do a little bit more mathematics and assure yourself it's really good. So based so my on math or based on human expertise, what's what, what are good? They're, they're both going in. The Bayesian framework allows you to put a lot of human expertise in, yeah. um, but the math kind of guides you along that path and then kind of reassures you at the end, you could put that stamp of approval. Under certain assumptions, this thing will work. So Pratt, you asked the question, what's my favorite, you know, or what's yes. the most surprising nice idea? So one that is more accessible is something called false discovery rate, which is, um, you know, you, you're uh, making not just one hypothesis test or making one decision, you're making a whole bag of them. And in that bag of decisions, you look at the ones where you made a discovery. You announced that something interesting had happened. All right, that's gonna be some subset of your big bag. Mm -hmm. In the ones you made a discovery, which subset of those are bad? There are false, false discoveries. You like the fraction of your false discoveries among your discoveries to be small. Mm -hmm. That's a different criterion than accuracy or precision or recall or sensitivity and specificity. It's, it's a different quantity. Those latter ones are almost all of them um, um, have more of a frequentist flavor. They say, given the truth is that the null hypothesis is true, here's what accuracy I would get. Or given that the alternative is true, here's what I would get. So it's kind of going forward from the state of nature mm -hmm. to the data. The Bayesian goes the other direction from the data back to the state of nature. And that's actually what false discovery rate is. It says, given you made a discovery, okay, that's conditioned on your data, mm -hmm. what's the probability of the hypothesis? Mm -hmm. It's going the other direction. Uh, and so um, the classical frequency look at that, say, well, I can't know that there's some priors needed in that. And the empirical Bayesian goes ahead and pl plows forward and starts writing down these formulas and realizes at some point, some of those things can actually be estimated in a reasonable way. Oh, wow. And so it's kind of, it's a beautiful set of ideas. So I, I th this kind of line of argument has come out, it's not certainly mine, but it, it, it sort of came out from Robbins around 1960. Uh, Brad Efron has, has uh, written beautifully about this in various papers and books. And, uh, and the FDR is, you know, Ben Yamini uh, in, in Israel, um, John Story did this Bayesian interpretation and so on. So I've just uh, absorbed these things over the years and find it a very healthy way to think about statistics. Let me ask you about 
intelligence to jump slightly back out into philosophy, perhaps. You said that, uh, maybe you can elaborate, but uh, you said that defining just even the question of what is intelligence is a, or is, is a very difficult question. Is it a useful yeah. question? Do you think we'll one day understand the fundamentals of human intelligence and what it means, uh, you know, have good uh, benchmarks for general intelligence that we put before our machines? So I don't work on these topics so much. You're really asking a, a question for a psychologist, really. And I sort of studied okay. some, but I don't consider myself um, at least an expert at this point. Um, you know, a psychologist aims to understand human intelligence, right? And I, I think many of the psychologists I know are fairly humble about this. They, they might try to understand how a baby understands, you know, whether something's a solid or a liquid or uh, whether something's hidden or not. And... Um, Maybe the, how a uh, you know, child starts to learn the meaning of certain words, what's a verb, what's a noun, and also, you know, slowly but surely trying to figure out things. Um, but humans' ability to take a really complicated environment, reason about it, abstract about it, find the right abstractions, communicate about it, interact, and so on, is just, you know, really staggeringly rich and complicated. Um, and so, you know, I think in all humidity, we don't, think we're kind of aiming for that in the near future. And certainly psychologists doing experiments with babies in the lab or with people talking is, is has a much more limited aspiration. And, you know, Kahneman and Tversky would look at our reasoning patterns and they're they're not deeply understanding all the how we do our reasoning, but they're sort of saying, hey, here's some here's some oddities about the reasoning and some things you should you need to think about it. But also I as I emphasize in things some things I've been writing about, um, when, you know, AI, the revolution hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Um great I've blog been, post. I I've been emphasizing that, you know, if you step back and look at uh intelligent systems of any kind, whatever you mean by intelligence, it's not just the humans or the animals or, you know, the the plants or whatever. Or, you know, so a market that brings goods into a city, you know, food to restaurants or something every day, uh, is a system. It's a decentralized set of decisions. Looking at it from far enough away, it's just like a collection of neurons. Everyone, every neuron is making its own little decisions, presumably in some way. Mm -hmm. And if you step back enough, every little part of an economic system is making its all of its decisions. And just like with a brain, who knows what the individual neuron doesn't know what the overall goal is, right? But something happens at some aggregate level. Same thing with the economy. People eat in a city, and it's robust. It works at all scales, small villages to big cities. It's been working for thousands of years. Uh, it works rain or shine, so it's adaptive. Um, so all the kind of, you know, those are adjectives one tends to apply to intelligent systems. Robust, adaptive, you know, you don't need to keep adjusting it. It's self-healing, self whatever. Plus, not perfect. You know, intelligences are never perfect, and markets are not perfect. Um, but I do not believe in this era that you cannot that you can say, well, our computers, our humans are smart, but you know, no markets are not. Well, markets are, so they are intelligent. Uh, now, uh, we humans didn't evolve to be markets; <laughs> we've been participating in them, right? But we are not ourselves a market per se. Um, the neurons could be viewed as a market. You of can. Science. There, there's economic, you know, neuroscience kind of perspectives. That's yeah. interesting to, to pursue all that. Yeah. The point, though, is, is that if you were to study humans and really be a, the world's best psychologist to study for thousands of years and come up with the, the theory of human intelligence, you might have never discovered principles of markets, you know, supply demand curves and, you know, matching and auctions and all that. Uh, those are real principles and they lead to a form of intelligence that's not maybe human intelligence. It's arguably another kind of intelligence. There probably are third kinds of intelligence or fourth that none of us are really thinking too much about right now. So if you really, and, and all those are relevant to computer systems in the future. Certainly the market one is relevant right now, whereas understanding of human intelligence is not so clear that it's relevant right now, probably not. Um, so if you want general intelligence, whatever one means by that, or you know, understanding intelligence in a deep sense and all that, it, it is definitely has to be not just human intelligence. It's got to be this broader thing. And that's not a mystery. Markets are intelligent. So the, I, you know, it's definitely not just a philosophical stance to say, we got to move beyond intelli human intelligence. That sounds ridiculous, Yeah, but it's and, not. And in that blog post, you define different kinds of like intelligent infrastructure, II, which I really like. It's some of the concept you've just been uh, describing, do you see ourselves, if we see Earth, human civilization as a single organism, do you think the intelligence of that organism, when you think from the perspective of markets and intelligence infrastructure is increasing? Is it increasing linearly? Is it increasing exponentially? What do you think the future of that intelligence? Yeah, is? I don't know. 
I, I don't tend to think, I don't tend to answer questions like that because, you know, that's science fiction. I, I was and... hoping to catch you <laughs> off guard. <laughs> well, it's... again, because you said it's so far in the future, it's fun to ask and you'll probably, you know, like you said, predicting the future is, is really nearly impossible. But say as an axiom, one day we create a human level, a superhuman level intelligent, not the scale of markets, but the scale of an individual. What do you think is, is what do you think it would take to do that? Or maybe to ask another question is how would that system be different than the biological human beings that we see around us today? Is it possible to say anything interesting to that question or is it just a stupid question? It's not a stupid question, but it's science fiction. Science fiction. And so I'm totally happy to read science fiction and think about it from time in my own life. I love the, uh, there was this like brain in a vat kind of, you know, little thing that people were talking about when I was a student. I remember, you know, imagine that, uh, um, you know, between your brain and your body, there's, a, you know, there's a bunch of wires, right? Uh, and suppose that every one of them was replaced with a, uh, a literal wire. And then suppose that wire was turned into actually a little wireless, you know, there's a receiver and sender. So the brain has got all the senders and receiver, you know, on, on all of its exiting, uh, you know, axons and all the dendrites down in the body have are replaced with senders and receivers. Now you could move the body off somewhere and put the brain in a vat, right? And um, then you could do things like start killing off those senders and receivers one by one. And after you've killed off all of them, where is that person? You know, they thought they were out in the body walking around the world and they moved on. So those are science fiction things. Those are fun to think about. It's just intriguing about where is, what is thought? Where is it? And all that. And uh, I think every 18-year-old should take philosophy classes and think about these things. And I think that everyone should think about what could happen in society that's kind of bad and all that. But I really don't think that's the right thing for most of us that are my age group to be doing and thinking about. Uh, I really think that uh, we have so many more present, you know, uh, challenges and dangers and real things to build and all that, um, such that, uh, you know, uh, spending too much time on science fiction, at least in public fora like this, I think is, is not what we should be doing. Maybe over beers in private. That's right. In very, I'm wel welcome. welcome. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to broadcast where I have beers because this is going to go on Facebook and I don't <laughs> yeah, want a lot of people showing up there. But um, yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I, I love Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, YouTube. I have, I'm optimistic and hopeful, but uh, maybe, maybe I don't have grounds for such optimism and hope. But let me ask, <laughs> in term, you've uh, mentored some of the brightest, sort of some of the seminal figures in the field. Can you uh, give advice to people who are undergraduates today? What does it take to take, you know, advice on their journey if they're interested in machine learning, in AI, in, in uh, the ideas of markets from economics and psychology and all the kinds of things that you're exploring? What, what, sh what steps should they take on that journey? Well, yeah, first of all, the door's open and second, it's a journey. I like your language there. Um, uh, it is not that you're so brilliant and you have great brilliant ideas and therefore that's that's just, uh, you know, that's how you have success or that's how you enter into the field. Uh, it's that you apprentice yourself, you you spend a lot of time, you work on hard things, you um, try and pull back and you be as broad as you can, you talk to lots of people. Um, and it's like entering in any kind of a, a creative community. There's um, years that are needed and uh, human connections are critical to it. So, you know, I think about you know, being a, a musician or being an artist or something, you don't just, you know, immediately from day one, you know, you, you, you're a genius and therefore you do it. No, you, um, you know, practice really, really hard on basics and you uh, be hum humble about where you are and then and you realize you'll never be an expert on everything. So you kind of pick and, and there's a lot of randomness and a lot of kind of um, luck, but um, luck just kind of picks out which branch of the tree you go down, but you'll go down some branch. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a community. So the graduate school is, a, I, I still think is one of the wonderful phenomena that we have in our, in our world. It's, it's very much about apprenticeship with an advisor. It's very much about a group of people you belong to. It's a four or five year process. So it's plenty of time to start from kind of nothing to come up to something, you know, more, more expertise, and then to start to have your own creativity start to flower, even surprising your own self. Um, and it's a very cooperative endeavor. It's, I think a lot of people, uh, think of, um, science is highly competitive, and I think in some other fields it might be more so. Um, here it's way more cooperative than you might imagine. Um, and people are always teaching each other something, and people are always more than happy to uh, 
be clear that so I, I feel I'm an expert on certain kind of things, but I'm very much not expert on lots of other things, and a lot of them are relevant, and a lot of them are I should know, but it should in some sense I you know you you don't. So um, I'm always willing to reveal my ignorance to people around me so they can teach me things, and uh, I think a lot of us feel that way about our field. So it's very cooperative. Uh, I might add, it's also very international because it's so cooperative. We we see no barriers, and uh, so that the nationalism that you see, especially in the current era and everything, is just at odds with the way that most of us think about what we're doing here. Where this is a human endeavor, and we we cooperate and are very much trying to do it together for the you know the, the benefit of everybody. So, last question: Where and how and why did you learn French, and which <laughs> language is more beautiful, English or French? Um, great question. So, um, first of all, I think Italian is actually more beautiful than French and English, and I also speak that. So, I'm 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 married to an Italian, and I have kids, and we speak Italian. Um, anyway, though, uh, all kidding aside, uh, every language allows you to express things a bit differently, um, and it is one of the great fun things to do in life is to explore those things. So. Uh, in fact, when I kids or are, are, you know, teens or uh, college students ask me what they stu study, I say, well, you know, do what your heart, where your heart is. Certainly, do a lot of math. Math is good for everybody, but do some poetry and do some history and do some language too. Um, you know, throughout your life, you'll want to be a thinking person. You'll want to have done that. Um, for me, uh, yeah, French I learned when I was, uh, I'd say, a late teen. Um, I was living in the middle of the country in Kansas, and uh, <laughs> not much was going on in Kansas, with all due respect to Kansas. But uh, And so my parents happened to have some French books on the shelf, and just in my boredom, I pu pulled them down, and I found this is fun. And I kind of learned the language by reading. And, um, and when I first heard it spoken, I had no idea what was being spoken, but I realized I had somehow knew it from some previous life, and so I, I made the connection. Um, but then, you know, I traveled and just, I, I love to go beyond my own barriers and uh, my, my own comfort or whatever. And I found myself in, you know, on trains in France next to, say, older people who had, you know, lived a whole life of their own. And uh, the ability to communicate with them was, was, was uh, you know, special. And the uh, uh, ability to also see myself in other people's shoes and have empathy and, and kind of work on that language as part of that. Um, so... Um, so after that kind of experience, um, and also embedding myself in French culture, which is you know quite quite amazing. You know, languages are rich not just because there's something inherently beautiful about it, but it's all the creativity that went into it. So I learned a lot of songs, read poems, read books, um, and then I was here actually at MIT where we're doing the, the podcast today. And uh, young professor, um, uh, you know, not yet married, and. Uh, um, you know, not having a lot of friends in the area, so I just didn't have, I was just getting kind of a bored person. I said, I heard a lot of Italians around. There's happened to be a lot of Italians at MIT, a lot of yeah. Italian professor for some reason. Yeah. And so I was kind of vaguely understanding what they were talking about. I said, well, I should learn this language too. So I, I, I did. <laughs> uh, and then later met my spouse and, uh, you know, wow. Italian became a more important part of my life. But um, hmm. but I go to China a lot these days. I go to, you know, to Asia, I go to Europe. And um, every time I go, I kind of uh, am amazed by the richness of human experience and the, the, the People don't have any idea if you haven't traveled, kind of how you know, amazingly rich. And I, I love the diversity. I, I, uh, it's not just a buzzword to me. It really means something. I love the, you know, the, being able to embed myself with other people's experiences. And uh, so, yeah, learning language is a big part of that. I think I've said in some interview at some point that if I had, you know, millions of dollars and infinite time or whatever, what would you really work on if you really wanted to do AI? And for me, that is natural language and, and really done right. You know, deep understanding of language. Um, that's to me an amazingly interesting scientific challenge, and uh, one we're very far away on. One so. we're very far away, but good natural language people are kind of really invested. Then in I think a lot of them see that's where the core of AI is. That if you understand that, you really help human communication. You understand something about the human mind, the semantics that come out of the human mind, and I agree. Uh, I think that will be such a long time. So I didn't do that in my career just because I kind of I was behind in the early days. I didn't kind of know enough of that stuff. I was at MIT. I didn't learn much language. Uh, and it was too late at some point to kind of spend a, a whole career doing that. But I admire that field. And uh, um, and so in my little way, by learning language, um, you know, kind of uh, that part of my brain is, um, has been trained up. Jan was right. You truly are the Miles Davis of machine learning. I, I don't think there's a better place than it. was a, Mike, it was a huge honor talking to you today. Merci beaucoup. All right. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Michael I. Jordan. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, Cash App. Download it, use code LEXPODCAST, 
you'll get $10, and $10 will go to FIRST, an organization that inspires and educates young minds to become science and technology innovators of tomorrow. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, let me leave you with some words of wisdom from Michael I. Jordan from his blog post titled Artificial Intelligence, The Revolution Hasn't Happened Yet, calling for broadening the scope of the AI field. We should embrace the fact that what we are witnessing is the creation of a new branch of engineering. The term engineering is often invoked in a narrow sense, in academia and beyond, with overtones of cold, effectless machinery and negative connotations of loss of control by humans. But an engineering discipline can be what we want it to be. In the current era, we have a real opportunity to conceive of something historically new, a human-centric engineering discipline. I'll resist giving this emerging discipline a name, but if the acronym AI continues to be used, let's be aware of the very real limitations of this placeholder. Let's broaden our scope, tone down the hype, and recognize the serious challenges ahead. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.